started. All right. Everybody can see the slides. Good. Yes. All right. So just as, as a sort of like intro to, to what, why am I talking about this and what's interesting about it for you, um, th there's two main areas I want to cover today. Num number one, I want to introduce you to uh, our, our main business problems at Lyft and why they're kind of like interesting and unique. So, uh, so you know, running a ride sharing marketplace is, is sort of an interesting business and has a lot of unique uh, machine learning and data science problems. So I'll talk a little bit about our business problems. Um, but part of my goal today is to introduce you to this like causal inference lens as applied to machine learning uh, and data science problems that we we face in practice and industry. And I think it's a it's obviously something that people have been introduced to and learned a lot about in the last few years. But but I think seeing concrete examples of how you can apply causal inference ideas to help improve uh, you know, a model or a business problem, I think are, are a little bit scarce right now. And so I, I wanna help provide sort of like an example of how you can think about where causal inference can help fit in for you and some of the problems that you work on. So I hope that it provides an idea for, and some ideas for maybe where you can look for more information about causal inference and, and where it might be useful. All right. So just to kind of like frame, like what is Lyft's core problem? It, it is matching. Um, and so we operate a two-sided marketplace where one side of the market are drivers who would like to provide rides to riders and get paid for it. And then one side are riders who'd like to go somewhere and, and be matched to one of those drivers. And so re really at the end of the day, like what are we trying to do is create a very efficient set of matches between the requests and the available drivers that we have in our marketplace. So a very simple model of our business is we have this bipartite graph that starts without edges and then we're gonna produce edges in them. And um, you can kind of see that there's a, there's a combinatorially large number of possible matches between the requests and available drivers. This is, this is kind of like a, like a large design space for us, and we have to figure out how to do this very quickly and efficiently and try to get the best possible allocation um, between these two things. And so our, our task here is, is, to, is to form these edges. And even for this four to four matching problem, there are 24 possible allocations. And that's not even including the possibility that, that we might fail to match um, one of the pairs because we might think, hey, we want to keep this driver around in case there's a better request later. So, so that even explodes the design space even further. And so each one of those matches that we could create among the, each one of these sets of matches that we could create among these pairs of items is a, is a different world we could live in. It's a different counterfactual. So it's one way to think about it from a causal inference standpoint is that we're we're, we're choosing from among a very large set of possible options for universes that we could proceed in <laughs> and it affects everybody. And so we'll talk a little bit about like, you know, how we, how we think about the causal effect of, of matching. So in causal inference, uh, one popular approach is, is to draw a graph um, of, of causes to effects. And so edges here represent sort of like, you know, variables that affect other variables. Um, and so this is this is a way that we could represent a marketplace as a graph, which is that we have requests, which are variables about you know where the where the rider is, where they'd like to go, you know what price that they've they've selected, how long they've been waiting, and then you know drivers who are sort of like where are they and how long have they been without a without a passenger and what direction are they headed in and things like that. And so all these variables become inputs into a function that produces an allocation. Uh, of requests to drivers. And then we, th we then the drivers and riders both face consequences from those matches. So we could match them very well or match them very poorly. And so riders might wait a long time or, or a short time and drivers might make, make a lot of money or not a lot of money depending on how well we do matching. Um, and so the, the kind of key piece about this graph and something very interesting to think about is that every, every single one of these effects on the right-hand side has a cause on the left-hand side. So every variable causes every other variable via this kind of super node in the middle. And this is our role is to be this, be this matching policy, but the matching policy creates a high amount of like inter interconnectedness in the marketplace. So, so if this rider were going somewhere different or their request was canceled, then it could affect any of the other drivers or any of the other riders. And that's sort of an important, an important piece of our, of our marketplace is that it's so, so interconnected and it makes causal inference quite difficult because each one of these uh, causes affects everything else. And uh, it's even a little bit more complicated than that when you add dynamics, which is like we actually match every three seconds or five seconds, you know, I don't remember. Um, and so we'll have sort of a matching cycle here and a matching cycle here. And then at the end of the matching cycle, we like we leave some state and that state becomes input into the future matching cycle. 
And so when you think about it this way, all of these effects in the second period were actually caused by all of these requests and driver state at the beginning of the first period. And so we can kind of like, uh, you know, run this process forward in time and, and see that everything affects everything else across all of time. So even something that happened like many days ago <laughs> could potentially have affected, you know, what happened to your to your particular pickup today. It's, I know that that sort of sounds very diffuse and it's, but it, but it is a, it is a real um, kind of first order business problem for us is that the way that we match causes a state to occur in the marketplace that can be useful or not useful for future matching. It's, it, it is something that we like to model and think about. So we have a causal graph and one of the most useful things you can do with causal graphs is think about interventions. Um, interventions are, th are places where we would like to like change something about one of these variables and, um, and then, and then kind of like make some hypothesis or estimate of like what's going to happen as a result of that. And, and for, and for Lyft, this is our business is that we, we don't get to, we, we run this marketplace, but really what we're kind of interested in are like, what can we do to improve the marketplace and, and make it more efficient and make it better for riders and drivers. And so really there are in, in concept, like three places that we can intervene in a marketplace. Um, there are uh, rider side interventions, driver side interventions, and then like matching policy side interventions. Um, so on the rider side, uh, we can change prices or give people coupons and that's, that might create more or fewer requests and requests at different times and places, um, which would change this, like this purple input node, which would change the output over here. Um, and then there are interventions that affect available drivers, like providing incentives for them to drive like additional bonuses or information about where demand is. And so that would change their positions or whether they're driving at all. And then finally, we have our ability to change how we match, which is the our, what we call uh, matching or dispatch. And, and that will prioritize certain kinds of matches over, the, over others. And that will also have effects on these two outcomes. And so uh, today I'm gonna restrict the talk mostly to this, uh, this last category. These first two are very interesting and we spend a lot of time on them, but I think um, the, more, the more interesting one, the more complicated one is definitely the matching policy. And just to, just to kind of briefly discuss why we would care about rider and driver side interventions is, is that uh, in, in markets that have different balance, like more drivers than riders or more riders than drivers, we end up in, in over or under supply situations and we get sort of inefficient matching outcomes as a result of that. People are left uh, waiting to be matched or drivers are left idle and not earning money. And that's sort of bad. So the, so the kind of like interventions that improve the amount of drivers are meant to balance the market or improving the number of riders making requests are meant to balance the market so that we end up being able to kind of do more like a one-to-one -one matching and not leave unmatched uh, demand or supply left over. So one of the primary challenges about understanding the effect of matching is that the effects of matching occur for both riders and for drivers and on at least three different time scales. And so here, here's a kind of a schematic of what's happening here. So the purple nodes are requests and the pink nodes are drivers. And we're gonna perform this matching task. And then we're gonna have effects for the drivers or the rider side on like how long they wait, what their pickup experience is like. This is like an immediate effect of us matching well or poorly, but also in the long term. So that customer might say, hey, I had a really long wait time. I probably, maybe I will try taking the, the bus next time or, or I'll walk because Lyft took, took too long. And so they don't use our service in the future. And so this, the effect of matching also occurs, you know, late, later in time, maybe like a month away or a week away in that we don't observe demand from that particular rider anymore. And, and this is very important for our business because we'd really like people to continue to use our service. Likewise, on the driver side, uh, drivers, when they are able to be matched efficiently, we get a very fast pickup time, which means that uh, they earn more money per hour because uh, time, time spent picking up a passenger isn't, isn't compensated as highly or at all. Uh, and so we'd like them to spend very little time picking up passengers. Um, then after they complete the ride, they're dropped off in a particular place. And so, you know, maybe the driver ended up at the airport and they had to wait in a really long line because there were a lot of drivers already at the airport. That would be a bad outcome for them. Um, or maybe they ended up in a neighborhood where there aren't a lot of uh, ride requests. And so they had to have a really far pickup experience for their next drop off. Um, and so drop off location is kind of an intraday effect that, that matters for our business. And, and then finally, we also care about retention for drivers. So did they have good pickup experiences where they dropped off on good locations? Did they earn a lot of money that day? And then are they likely to drive again in the future? 
So I, I think that this is a very interesting slide that I could do a whole talk about, but today for the rest of the talk, we're gonna mainly talk about these very short term outcomes because they're easier to reason about. Um, and so we're gonna really focus on these kind of like myopic uh, outcomes. These uh, you know, intraday and long-term outcomes are very first order for our business and something that we care about measuring and optimizing for, but it, it actually adds a whole, a whole host of estimation problems that we don't really want to get into today. Okay, so how do we think about doing matching? Um, uh, one, one way to think about uh, the matching problem is that we'd like to construct uh, a matrix of expected values of matching a particular driver to a particular request. Um, and so this matrix here will represent sort of like a score for a pair of items. So a request being the rows and a driver being the columns. So we have a set of features about drivers, like where they are, what direction they're headed in, um, how long they've been idle for, and then a set of features about our requests, like you know where the rider is, where they're going to, uh, you know maybe something about their historical behavior. And we're going to use the request features and the driver features to score the pairs. And so we're going to fill out this matrix. And, you know, in concept, this matrix might capture like all the costs and benefits of matching that particular request to the drivers or, or dispatching that driver to that particular request. And so in, in an ideal world, we're capturing all these sources of value and cost to the business in that score. So it should be like sort of capturing everything that we might care about. And then we solve this integer program, which is an allocation an allocation generator. So it sort of like generates a new matrix that subject that has this constraint of all the rows and columns must have a maximum sum of one, or so they could be either zero or one. And so that that's this allocation matrix. Um, and so this particular uh, scoring matrix generates this particular allocation matrix, where we sort of Driver, driver three go, goes to request one and driver one goes to request two and driver two goes to request request three. Um, and so like, you know, this allocation matrix might also have zeros in some of the columns if we just, you know, we don't wanna match, maybe we have some threshold at which we don't particularly think that the match is a good idea. So we might have some kind of re reserve score or something like that. Um, but, but in general, this is how we think about matching is that we want to produce this, this matrix. And if we have a good value for this matrix, we can assume that we can solve this integer program relatively quickly and generate an efficient allocation. Um, there's lots of additional idiosyncrasies to this that I, I won't get into. Like, for instance, we might swap allocations as we get better information over time. Uh, we have shared rides at Lyft. So we, we uh, you know, drivers can be matched to a, or sorry, requests can be matched to a driver who already has a ride with them. <laughs> Um, and so there's lots of reasons why this is like a simplification. Um, and then finally, like another simplification is this additivity. So when we solve this integer program, we're gonna just try to maximize the sum of the scores. That, so this matrix multiplied by this matrix summed, and, and that's gonna give us sort of the, the, the objective function for this particular allocation problem. But you can see that that assumes that they're additive, um, which, which they may not be. So sending the same two drivers to identical locations might be bad, might be good individually, but if we do it at the same time, we might send two drivers to a place where there's only one unit of demand. And so there can be like non-trivial interactions between the entries in this matrix. So the additivity is sort of a really necessary assumption to get before, or else we get into a very high dimensional space of, of, of score matrices and that would be bad. So typically we just assume additivity. Okay. So what is our job as Lyft? It's to perform this matching task in, the, in, in an optimal way. So, um, and since we know that matching uh, you know, is, is determined entirely by our score function, our job basically boils down to scoring. So how well can we score a request driver pair to maximize some overall objective that we have? And so let's assume that like V sub R and V sub D are all the, all the downstream value generated by dispatching a driver to a particular request, um, then we have really two versions of this optimization problem that we can we can try to execute. And to be honest, we tried both of them because we, we really need to be able to do both. The first approach is what I would characterize as top-down. Um, and so here we sort of have a score function. We have functional form for a score, which is like has some parameters theta. And it's just a deterministic function of things we know about the ride, things we know about the, the request, things we know about the driver and theta. 
And then we're going to try to use a sequence of experiments and targeting the sum of the total value generated to riders and drivers to select theta. Um, and so I'll, I'll spend just a minute or two talking about this top-down approach and how we think about doing this through, through experimentation and Bayesian optimization. Um, I will really spend the, the bulk of the talk on this bottom-up approach, which is to, to try to directly estimate the value generated to the request and to the driver by using this do operation here. So we're going to do dispatch a driver to a particular request. And we'd like to know the causal effect of dispatching that driver to that request compared to some counterfactual where we say, don't, don't dispatch them at all or dispatch them to an alternative request. And so this estimation problem is quite interesting and I'll talk about why this is hard and, and uh, how, we, how we think about approaching, uh, getting an unbiased estimate of this particular uh, uh, item of interest. On the experimentation side, uh, this, this is sort of a stylized blueprint of how we might do market optimization using just purely experiments. And so this, this is a causal inference approach, but it's sort of like a, an atheoretic one. So it's just sort of try, trying out values of parameters and, and using a heuristic policy and then trying to see which ones empirically generate the best uh, outcome for our objective function. And so th this procedure might work as follows. So we have, uh, we parameterize the score function. We say it's a function of the pickup time between the uh, request and the driver, and then how long the rider's been waiting. Uh, so we have alpha and beta are our two parameters, and we can draw a random version of them and then run the marketplace in a particular configuration. Um, and then in another configuration, we run it like in a control state where we sort of have picked some baseline values of alpha and beta. And so, you know, we can we can ra randomly add changes to these parameters in time and then use that to estimate the expected value of the total sum of rider and total sum of driver uh, value generated under different values of alpha and beta. And so this this expectation could be estimated using experiments. Uh, and, and the big challenge there is uh, is variance. Uh, we have very small sample sizes when we run these kinds of experiments, as I'll, as I'll show you in a moment. So how, how do these experiments uh, work in practice? As uh, people will call this sort of a switchback design, it's it's much more closely related to what I would call n of one trial, um, which is a which is sort of an experimental design used in medicine when you really only have like one patient to treat. <laughs> and so the, the way that we do that is we switch the treatment on and off in time, and and hopefully in a random way, so that we get some uh, some uh, variation in that particular outcome that that's not deterministic. Um, so here, treatment is randomly assigned into time buckets, and our design of this experiment is a sequence of start times and durations for the particular sequences of the parameters that we're going to run the marketplace in. So this is kind of like what that might look like in practice with a binary treatment. This would be like a single parameter, like proposing moving alpha from one to two. And so baseline would be alpha is one, and the treatment would be alpha is two. And so we would sort of cycle the market into two different states over time. And, and an efficient version of that design is uh, is this block randomized version where we run the experiment for two weeks and we use this paired design where within a given day, we we run, uh, we flip the experiment into A and B and then the following week we flip it back. And so we run, you know, the mor Monday morning has, we get a version of that in the treated group and also in the control group. And so we get this nice comparison across weeks and then also within the day. And so we call this reflection, and this reflection gives us better balance in the treatment assignment. So this means that like the, the, the distribution of the, treat, the treatment is, is more random or more balanced with respect to trends in the marketplace uh, over time. And so it helps us kind of control for intraday, intraweek dynamics of the marketplace. And, and Lyft's marketplaces have very strong kind of periodicity because rider and driver behavior is, is very driven by sort of, you know, business and personal needs that have a have a kind of schedule to them. So I won't spend too much more time on experimentation. There's actually a lot of Lyft talks and, and uh, blog posts out there about how we do these particular experimental designs. And it's very interesting in, in its own right. Um, the, the reason why I won't spend time on it is I, I think that it, experiments are sort of a, a shortcut to causal inference. They make it really easy to do causal inference because you don't have to worry about a lot of the problems that come up when you try to do uh, uh, causal inference without without a full ex a full perfect experiment, when we're able to do experiments like this, there's really no bias problem at all. We we only have a variance problem. It's just sort of like can we design 
an experiment that's very efficient, that uses our data very efficiently. But, but at the end of the day, we're always going to get an unbiased estimate from an experiment if it's designed properly. And so it's sort of like it's a nice shortcut because it, it doesn't mean we have to make very few assumptions uh, to, to get an answer from an experiment. Um, but in a lot of cases, we can't run the experiment that we would like, ideally. And so we need to think about how do we get the answer that we want without an experiment? So that's where this, uh, this next section is really going to be, I think, a little bit more interesting. OK. So I described the top-down approach to optimizing the marketplace. Um, the bottom-up approach is just to say, let's get scoring to be uh, as perfect as possible. So that means estimating these entries in this matrix, uh, you know, to the to the with the lowest amount of bias and the lowest amount of variance that we can. Um, and the interesting thing about the entries in this matrix is that they're all little counterfactual quantities of interest. So they 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 represent potential outcomes. If you're familiar with that framework, which is sort of like a, a world where we dispatched this driver to this particular request, we would expect the driver and the and the request to have this much value associated with it. Um, so uh, for the rest of the, the talk, I'm going to think about this value as just being the uh, probability that the ride completes. So that means that the driver successfully picks up the rider. So that means that the driver had a fast and successful pickup and the, the rider uh, waited short enough time that they didn't cancel the ride. So drivers can cancel rides and riders can cancel rides. So one way to think about the score in this matrix is just sort of the probability that both of them complete the task that we asked them to do and then generate the kind of ride that we wanted for the marketplace. So if these entries represent expected values of a pickup, then, then summing over them would be sort of like maximizing the total number of rides that are generated in Lyft's marketplace uh, per in this particular matching cycle. OK, so what's hard about computing this expected value? It sounds like a pretty standard classifier problem, right? So we just want to predict the probability. Um, to talk about why it's hard, I'm going to do a one slide introduction to causal inference for machine learners. <laughs> so why, why is machine, why is causal inference, uh, what is the fundamental challenge of causal inference? Uh, people will give you many different answers to that. You can read entire books about it. I know Alesh did a whole, a whole talk on it earlier. Um, and uh, I think it's really interesting to think about all the different ways you can be trained to do uh, causal inference. But here, here is sort of like, if I had to simplify it to one slide, and focus on the kind of you know people who are more more trained in a machine learning background. This is what I would do. We care about uh, this outcome y, and we have we want to fit a model f hat, which has two things and two kinds of features. C is a feature which I would call a cause. So it's a thing that we we think that we ha we have control over in some way. So for us, this might be, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about it on the next slide, like pickup distance. So how far away is the right is the right driver from the request? But we also have some other other variable here, uh, which we may or may not observe, which is a feature that also predicts why, and may also determine whether that cause uh, the value of that particular cause. And so that makes x a confounder, and that's represented by this graph here. So x partially determines what what happens with y, and x also could potentially cause uh, the cause to happen. Um, and so, so what, what happens in causal inference is that if we have confounding, then we are estimating or training this model here on data where x is predictive or is determining the value of the cause. So, so this is the joint distribution of x and the cause. And so since they're correlated, we're, tra we're training on this particular distribution. What we care about is, in a, in a causal effect, is to estimate the value of the model on data where the cause is decoupled from, from x. So the cause is moved or, or varied in, a, in, a, in an exogenous way. And this would represent sort of an intervention where the you know, we, we, we directly change the cause. And so we don't change x. And so, so the, the value of the cause is totally independent from x. So, so a good mental model for what's going on with confounding and why causal inference is hard is that the data that you have available is collected under a certain distribution. The data that you're going to evaluate your model on is collected under a different distribution. And so by evaluating your model, training and evaluating your model on this distribution, you don't get a good answer to how well it would perform under this particular distribution where X and, X and the cause are, are, are not correlated, have no, no, no relationship at all. 
So I'm going to use this lens quite a bit here, which is that like this is a distributional shift problem, which is that your, your, the data that we have to train the model is different than the data that we're going to use for the model at prediction time. And so we need to figure out how to sort of address this mismatch between these two things. So here is, here's our model that we're trying to fit, which is slightly more complicated than the one I just described, but, but not, not so much so. So here, the cause is m r sub d, which is the match value. So whether we matched uh, that request to that particular driver, which takes the value in zero, 0 or 1. And then XRD will be features about the request and the driver. So these are things like their locations from which we might compute something like distance. And so what we expect is that like conditioning on match, we sh sorry, we, we would like to know sort of like what happens when we match given different amounts of um, distance between the, the rider and the driver. So that would be this, this estimate of interest here. The problem is that the other thing that determines whether we get whether we match a rider to a driver is the rest of the marketplace. So maybe we have a lot of uh, other potential matches. And so we we can we, your potential your probability of getting matched might depend on sort of like if we have very few drivers in the marketplace, you might have a very low probability of getting matched to any particular driver. And that would maybe even if you were very close to a driver, there would just be somebody else that was even closer because we have so much so many requests relative to drivers. And so this is this is sort of like an unobserved confounder in some ways. We actually observe this variable; it just needs to be uh, explicitly included in the model. And, and I'll talk about basically the point of this talk is that failing to include these potential confounders in the model will generate bias in your estimate of the effect of matching on the outcome. So I'll try to make this a lot clearer than this particular diagram through a, through a, a numerical example. So we're actually going to go in and, and generate data from a from a marketplace and, and show you what happens. And at the end at the end of the day, the thing to keep thinking about is like what happens when we condition on MRD versus not condition on MRD. So here's a, a little mini marketplace that I generated data for. So all the rides, the requests, and the drivers were um, just put into random two dimensional space. Uh, so they're just you know. Uh, place there. And then I'm going to run, I'm going to compute the distance between them, between all pairs. So that's this like this list of distances here. Then I'm going to use the integer programming problem that I described to, to choose the, the, the optimal pairing between it. So, so I leave this, this rider's too far away from all the drivers. So she doesn't get a ride. And then these other riders get matched as so. And so this is the distance minimizing allocation. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is that when we are going to compute what happens to the outcome of dispatching this driver to this ride, um, we are only going to get as training data these three observations. So there are nine possible pairs that we're going to score, and we need to score all nine of them. But for our training data, we're only going to observe the ones that were assigned. So this is a this is this is sort of the fundamental problem. Uh, of causal inference for for matching in a two-sided marketplace is we only observe the matches that we historically created ourselves. And we tend to create matches between pairs of items that have certain properties because we, we have a scoring function that tries to optimize something. And so by, by virtue of optimizing, we're creating a selection bias in the data we have available for training our models. And so we'll, we'll see in a moment what the consequences of this are. Okay, so what does selection bias look like in practice? Um, as I said, due to our optimization, we usually try to match people to shorter rides. Rides with low distances are, are better. They, they lead to better pickup times, and, uh, and that helps drivers and riders. Um, and so what we end up happening, and this is, this is simulated data where I, I'm simulating the density of the distances in the marketplace uh, for assigned rides and unassigned rides. So unassigned rides have kind of a wide distribution, including like some very large values of distances. Um, assigned rides have much more mass at very short distances because we're trying to, to generate these pairs that have shorter distances between them. So the training data, the data we'll have available for estimating the effective distance on conversion is going to condition on MRD equals one, which is sort of conditioning a little bit on having a high score or a low distance between between the pair of items. And so but at the time when we're scoring and we need to we need to fill out a score for all values in this matrix, 
um, we're going to uh, we're going to have this full distribution of distances as as the distribution that's the target. And this mismatch between these two distributions is is is, is the crux of the problem. Is that we have sort of like data that we're training on isn't isn't uh, perfectly representative of the data that we'll be predicting on and needing to use as an input into our optimization. So the first problem that, that stands out really quite starkly in, in an example like this is that these distributions have may fail to have common support, which means that there's no density in the target distribution, but there is density I'm oh, sorry, there's no density in the training distribution, but there is density in the target distribution. Um, and so this is called a positivity violation in the causal inference literature. And, and the way to think about this is that uh, we're, we're trying to form an estimate of what would happen if we dispatched a driver to a, a request that was maybe four miles away, um, but we had never assigned a pair of <laughs> a driver to that particular distance before. And so our training data is not capable of actually answering any questions about what would happen in, the, in that particular situation. Whereas like when we're scoring, when we're gonna have to score pairs of items that, that meet this criteria, we can end up with uh, you know, cases where we're forced to make a prediction about what would happen in that particular situation. And um, something to keep, really keep in mind when you're training machine learning models is that they, they don't tell you when you're extrapolating, they will just do it. <laughs> So you know, most machine learning models are, are are sort of like you can put in any inputs that you want, and they will make a prediction, and they won't tell you that there are no observations in the training data that are even close to the one that you're asking for a prediction for, unless you're doing something like k-nearest neighbors or, or sort of like an explicit like kernel-based algorithm that that has uncertainty estimates. You're usually just going to get sort of like an overconfident prediction about what will happen in this particular range of the data. So what does this look like in practice? Let's go and like train a model on the simulated data that I just that I just showed you. So um, the blue the blue line here is data that was trained on the assigned observations only, and the red data the red model was trained on the unassigned observations only. And we can see that they agree mostly for the short distances, and then with the longer distances they start to diverge, um, and Particularly, uh, the, the two big uh, the two big problems that are coming out here are that on the assigned data for the for the blue line, we have very high variance of of, of uh, error for the model for long distances, and it's because we have very little data there. We we have you know we go back to the distribution. There's just not a lot of mass here, so we get high variance estimates in that particular region. And then for these very long uh, very long distances. We get no predictions at all if it were a method that that we're aware of the, the support for which it was trained. So no unbiased predictions at, are are possible at all, and high, only high, very high variance estimates are possible for these medium distances. Um, so we can take a step back and think about um, other other related problems for a moment. Um, so think about like a recommender system or, or search ranking or something like that. Um, one of the we're, 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 we're performing a very similar task where we have you know items items here and users here and we're filling in scores and then we're gonna instead of doing an allocation we're doing a ranking problem. So uh, you know when I used to work for Facebook, one of the problems is that we might have seen sort of like stories that we'd like to show in newsfeed and we want to score them, but we never shown somebody a story like this before. So maybe it was from a friend that you have never interacted with historically. And it's it's a case where we just don't have data in the in in this particular range of the distribution. This just happens to be a one-dimensional distribution that we can reason about. But in high dimensions, uh, it, it's very likely that you have examples that that don't aren't characterized well by your training data at all. And so in those cases, we either make a very high variance estimate or we make an extrapolated estimate. And and those things can be wrong for for various reasons, and it can cause our our um, our ranking algorithm to be suboptimal. So, so just like just lift state is very similar. It's just that like ours is even more constrained in that we can only make a very small number of matches. So, so we sort of end up with like very very highly selected assignments rather than just like loosely as loosely selected assignments. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about confounding. So the positivity violations are mostly causing either variance or our inability to make predictions on particular ranges, which are both causal inference problems in the sense that um, we, it's like P 
people, we can't make, we can't say what would happen for a treatment if, if there are people that have never gotten to the treatment before that we'd like to make a prediction for. So there's a set of people that sort of like, we've never observed them um, in, in a certain state of the world. Um, confounding is a very different and more or more pernicious problem where there's a where there's a, a reason why the model will be biased even if you have all the data that you need. And so I'm going to describe sort of like a source of confounding with lift data that, that is that is uh, derived from this exact effect. So here are nine little mini markets for lift, and the the along the columns here is the number of drivers in the marketplace. So I have three, nine and 27 drivers. And then I have number of requests, three, nine, and 27 requests. So this is a very thick market where there are many drivers, many riders. Um, this is a very thin market where there are just a small number of, of both. And then we have these like oversupplied and undersupplied markets where there are lots of drivers and small number of requests, lots of requests and small number of drivers, and then everything in between. Now look at look very quite closely at like the distances of these lines. This is just like one draw from the distribution, but you can see that uh, in these really over and undersupplied markets, we end up with very short drive times because there's a lot of one side of the marketplace and very small number of the other ones. So these people get very lucky and they get very short pickups, and then we get like you know a relatively long distance for for very thin markets because uh, there's a very low likelihood that there's a driver or a rider close by, and so the the distance here. The distance distribution that we select depends on the state of the marketplace. Is it in a high demand state or a low demand state? So we'll go back to this like common support idea. So here is the X variable and here is the cause. And now we're showing that our prediction, our training data is this blue distribution, which are sort of, this is drivers minus requests. So this would be a very oversupplied market. This would be a very undersupplied market. And you can see in this very balanced market, we get like a lot of longer distance uh, pickups um, that are actually dispatched. And so that more closely matches our, our predicted distribution. But for these other ones, we get very big mismatches. So this one's like, you know, a very oversupplied market or very undersupplied market. We get a lot of very close pickups and very, but really the, at the prediction time, we're gonna wanna know about um, some, of the, some of the further away ones. And so we, we don't have very good common support in these like in these areas here. So this, this alone is not a big problem. The problem becomes if there's a, it's just, just another view of what I was showing you is sort of like, this is like a, his, a density version of that, that exact plot that I just showed you um, that, that shows sort of like along the diagonal, we end up with like closer, closer distributions, but along this diagonal, they have sort of like bigger, bigger mismatches. So where's the problem come from? Well, if market balance also affects conversion, via this arrow here, which, which is manifest in sort of that the distance, relationship between distance and conversion varies by the state of the marketplace. And we fail to account for this relationship while we're fitting the data. Then we end up with a uh, bias from confounding in the fitted model. And so here's an example that I just constructed numerically from exactly this data that I'm showing you where the red line here is the relationship that is true, is the true average relationship between distance and conversion in our data across all pairs. And I can estimate this because it's a simulation. And the blue data is the data, the model that is trained on the selected data from pairs of matches that occur in the marketplace. And, and because of this confounding, and because we didn't properly account for the relationship between market balance and conversion, we end up with a steeper slope here. So we're assuming that these rides will convert at a higher rate than they actually will, and that actually moving them to a further distance will, de will decay conversion at a faster rate than it actually will. And so these cause mistakes in our allocation. So, so there are cases here where we can be more patient and try to match people from further away, but we wouldn't actually know that. And there's cases here where we want to sort of be prioritizing these. Uh, we think that we're overconfident that they'll be, they'll be matched. And finally, we see upward slopes in some cases here. So this is like, this is estimated to the data and shows that like a completely implausible thing is happening, which is that further distances generate higher conversion rates. Um, and so we, we see both problems, sort of like an overestimate of the negative slope here and a, an underestimate of the negative slope to the point that it's positive here. And this is, this is from the confounding problem that I just described. So how do we fix this? Um, the easiest way to fix it is to add randomization 
to your algorithm. So in a world where we actually completely dispatch at random, we get complete, perfectly matching distributions between assigned and unassigned rides. And so it's completely, uh, it's any model that we trained on the unassigned rides turns into a, or onto the assigned rides turns into a valid model for the assigned rides because those, the distributions match perfectly. Um, but just randomly perturbing the scores generates substantially more overlap in the distribution at, at the cost of marketplace performance degradation. So we sort of face some consequences for that, but we get better training data. And so now we face this trade off of like, do we want to do some near term degradation in the marketplace in order to generate a better model for, for future um, for future matching. Um, a, a, very, a very fast introduction to like how we might fix this problem is to use what's called importance weights. Importance weights are very simple. So we fit a, sec a second model, uh, that's a first model before we fit our model, which is a probability of a match given a distance. And actually this should have other information in as well, uh, which is about the total marketplace state. And then we call this a propensity score. And then one divided by the propensity score is proportional to some weights that we can use during training. Um, and you can see when I estimate the propensity scores and compute the weights that the sample data uh, has sort of like cases where I would I need the I need longer distances to have a higher weight in the algorithm. So basically I'm saying like put more priority during training on these further way observations because that will make them look get your training data look more like the distribution that I'm gonna see. At, at prediction time, the, the target distribution of interest. You can also see that if I add randomization to my algorithm, that I get a much flatter set of weights. So in, in this case, these observations and the tails have to do a lot of work in the in the algorithm to help to help. And so they're they're given a lot of weight. It actually adds a lot of variance to your estimates. And so adding randomization can help stabilize uh, the, the weights and, and make sure that you have lower variance estimates. And just to quickly describe like, like a pipeline for how we would compute importance weights. Well, we would, we have our potential matches. We're gonna run our matching algorithm and log the observations that we have. We can use the potential matches and the observation, the data that we observe to, to estimate a propensity model, which is the propensity of observing the data from the potential pool of data that we'd like to have observed. And then we invert that propensity score to create weighted observed data. And then this dashed line uh, represents the fact that these two distributions are now uh, matching distributions. So this, this target distribution, uh, this, this training distribution matches the target distribution of interest, which are the potential matches in the future. And just to sort of like, uh, I, I promised a, a sort of like, a, 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 a bit of content about like how this applies to other problems besides two-sided marketplaces. And I actually think that this is quite a generic uh, setup, which is that like we often want to fill in matrices like this with values and then do something to them that resembles an optimization and then produce an artifact that gets used in, in some sort of like, uh, you know, some system downstream. So recommendation systems, search ranking, ad ranking are all the kinds of problems where we're like scoring pairs of items. Um, then we're sorting them in some way and then trying to kind of create some kind of, uh, you know, allocation or, or, or ranking. So this is a, an extremely common setup. And, and what it means is that the, the entries of this matrix that you observe in practice, you know, users are much likely to more likely to interact and, and generate data for items that are highly ranked. So a one or a two or a three is going to be way more likely to provide you with feedback. And sometimes in, in search ranking or uh, ad ranking, they would call this position bias. Um, and it's it's just another form of confounding. And so, you know, failing to adjust for the position of the item in the ranking that you, that you use would cause your model to have poor performance uh, because it's sort of conflating the the rank the ranking with the actual quality of the match. And so, it's it's exactly the same sort of problem and can be framed exactly as a causal inference problem, uh, as I described earlier. And then, so just to conclude really quickly, uh, I, know, I know I'm running short on time. Algorithmically matched data is a special kind of data. Um, when you use your models uh, to create predictions and then that create that is the process that generates your data, then you probably have a confounding problem. Uh, that means that your target data, it doesn't match the data that you're training on. And causal inference as a, as a discipline provides a toolkit for checking and fixing these problems because we can think about this as a, as a selected data problem where the, where the, the cause is sort of uh, being, being coupled with uh, other variables. And so there are three main approaches that I described that I think are helpful. One is to keep track of the features used in the models assigning treatments. Uh, and so making sure to adjust for them either through weighting or sufficient control strategies. 
You can check for positivity by evaluating the common support. This is very easy to do. You can train a propensity score model and check how often the, the values are very close to zero. This indicates that there's fail failure to have support between the two distributions. And then adding randomization and experiments where possible, which creates additional overlap between the target distribution and the training distribution, and it facilitates uh, lower variance estimates of the, of, for the models that you'd like to fit. All right, I'm going to stop there because I want to have some time for questions. Looks like there's a bunch of them. 